Today we are going to be studying the book of First Peter, which is the first of the two letters that Peter wrote. Let's say a word of prayer and then we will get straight into it. Father, we just give you praise for another time that we're going to spend in your presence, in your word, your word of life, your word of truth, your word of power, that is going to change our lives in a dramatic way in the name of Jesus. We're trusting you, O oh God, for the move of the Holy Spirit upon your word today. The same way that the Holy Spirit moved upon your word in Genesis 1, thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit will also move upon your word today in our lives in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that God is seeking those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Thank you for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the truth that comes via the Holy Spirit into our hearts today that's going to help us to become more like Jesus. We look forward to the end result of today's meeting, which will be a blessing not only to us, but also to other people around us. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm kind of monitoring probably about three screens in the studio today. So if you, if you find me looking away from camera, it's not because I'm trying to ignore you. It's because I'm kind of focusing on something. I want to see what's going on on the other screen. So you're welcome. My name is Pastor Bumi, and uh, let's get straight into the book of First Peter. If you've been following us in our Bible reading, you will know that we're now reading the book of uh, First Peter. And next week, we're going to go on to Second Peter and the book of Jude. But let's get going today. Now, the approach that I'm going to have, so if you can bring up the slide that talks about the approach. The approach I'm going to have today is that I'm going to have a chapter summary, then... I'm going to probably give you about four or five lessons. If I can squeeze five lessons in, I will. Otherwise, I'll give you about four. And then we are going to have a discussion uh, after. If you want to join onto our um, uh, Zoom, then you can do that. And then if you have any questions or anything that I've said today that you want to verify, do put it in the description box and uh, we'll make sure we deal with that for you. All right, if you take a look at this slide, it gives you some of the titles that I've seen or some of the common scriptures, uh, verses, actually, from the book of Second Peter. Enduring unjust suffering, like newborn babes, desired as sincere milk of the word of God, the pure milk of the word of God. The scriptures like, cast all your worries on him because he cares for you. The living hope, somebody calls this letter the living hope. Another one says, uh, uh, you know, strangers in a foreign land. All of this applies. But let's take a look at some of the chapters. But before we do that, it's probably good for us to have a look at the man Peter. Now, as I read through the book of First Peter, something that occurred to me was that, wow, really, we should pay close attention to what Peter tells us. I'm asking myself, okay, why is that? Well, to pay close attention because he walked with the Lord. He walked with the Lord. He lived with Christ for, you know, at least around three years. So if somebody lived with Jesus and performed miracles just like Jesus did, remember, Peter is the only apostle that walked on water <laughs> he walked on water he performed many miracles he raised the dead he healed the sick and you you've got to listen to what he has to say it's this is just as simple as that because he is authentic is authoritative in the subject um, of of christianity Right, so let's look at who this man was. First thing is that he came from Galilee. Now, if you understand or know the map of Israel, which kind of looks like the map of UK, sort of, sort of, <laughs> um, you will notice that 
Galilee is in the northern part of the country. And it's almost as though we are saying that, oh, yeah, um, you know, Peter, he came from Leeds or he came from Birmingham or you might even go further north and say, well, he came from Scotland, you know. But he lived, he didn't live in the southeast because people in the southeast thinks that everything revolves around them. No, God specifically chose him, not from Judea, not from Jerusalem, not from those areas, but from the northern part of the country. And, of course, as we know, he was a fisherman, Luke chapter 5. Luke 5 tells us that, and John 21 tells us where he said he was going fishing. We also know that he was married. There are two scriptures that gives us that understanding um, that Peter was married. Number one is we know that when Jesus went to his house, he healed his mother-in-law, so he was married. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said that shouldn't he also take along with him a believing wife as do James and Cephas, meaning Peter, so we know he was a married guy. And then Peter unlocked nations. In Acts chapter 2, he was the one that unlocked the nations and the preaching that he, that he did in Acts 2. In Acts 8, it was sent by the church to uh, minister the Holy Spirit to people in, in Samaria that Philip had gone to minister in. And also in Acts chapter 10, he ministered in the house of Cornelius. In fact, he opened up the Gentile world to that. We also realize that Peter was very prominent in the church. For in Acts chapter 15, he gave a speech that persuaded all his colleagues, and then the, the speech was ratified by James. What else do we know about this man, Peter? Well, he was the first to catch the revelation about who Jesus was. He said to Christ, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you except from my father who is in heaven. So we know that Peter was extremely spiritual. He was also the first apostle to, I got that there, first apostle rebuked the Lord. Because the Bible tells us that he now began to rebuke Jesus, saying, no, 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 you're not going to the cross. You're not going to the cross. And Jesus gave him a bigger rebuke by telling him, get thee behind me, Satan, uh, because you care not about the things of God except for the things of men. Now, he was the first to deny Jesus three times. Now, you cannot compare Peter's sin with that of Judas. And doesn't it make you wonder? Well, you know, assuming Judas understood who Christ was, perhaps he also could have asked for forgiveness and received it, but he didn't. That means that he didn't know the Lord as much as he was supposed to. He just traveled with him for three years, did all the miracles and walked with him, but yet didn't really get the heart of Christ, that Jesus was somebody who was quite merciful. And then we know that he was the first also to be restored three times. So he sinned against the Lord three times by denying Christ three times. We know that before the cock crowed, he denied Jesus thrice. And then in the book of John chapter 20, chapter 21, we know that Jesus spoke to him and said, hey, Peter, you know, do you love me more than these? And he said, yeah, you know, Lord, you know all things. That happened three times. In other words, uh, we are told by Bible scholars that's the way that G Jesus restored Peter. We also know that it was the first to inspire the gospel, as I said, in Acts chapter 2, and it was one of the first leaders of the church. All right. Now, this is the man Peter. Now, let's take a look at the summary of the chapters. Um, we're going to take a look at chapter 1 Peter chapter 1. But before we do that also, let's uh, rem remind ourselves about the book now. Let's look at the book summary. Now, the book was sent to the saints who live in the now Turkey. Okay? Uh, Bithynia, Galatia, and all that part of the world is where Turkey is right now. And it's assumed that the letter was written from Rome uh, with Silas. And you remember the name Silas? That should uh, remind you of the man that went with 
Paul, when him and Barnabas has the rift, and uh, Barnabas went with John Mark, and he went with Silas, went with Paul. And uh, they traveled quite extensively after that period. We also understand from as a book summary that um, the book was written to encourage uh, the believers during a time of persecution. They were being persecuted for their faith, not because they did anything wrong, as the book illustrates to us, because it tells us that in many parts, but it's because that they were Christians, or they were being persecuted for their faith. And we also know that the book informs us how we must rely on a living hope. And I love the fact that it talks about a living hope. Not just a hope, but a hope that is alive. A hope that is real. A hope that you can count on. A hope that you can rely upon. A hope that works. He said, you've got a living hope. Praise God. All right. With that done, I'm going to ask a question in a moment. So don't think that, oh, is he going to ask a question? Because those who got the question two weeks ago, they've already received their Amazon vouchers. All right. Book summary. First Peter chapter one. Key messages in the first chapter. What are the key messages? What I've got here, salvation. Salvation would be a good word or topic that summarizes the first chapter of the book of Peter. Um, chapter 2, okay, before we go on to chapter 2, let's take a deeper look into the first chapter of Peter. So go to verse 1. You will notice what it says in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a bond servant of, of, I beg your pardon, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have been, who have obtained like fresh, oh, that's, no wonder. I was wondering, that just didn't read right. That's chapter two. Peter, and uh, that's a uh, book, uh, the, the second letter. First letter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the diaspora, of the uh, dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's right in that to those who are in exile, but yet they were chosen people. I think the NIV reads it differently, and I'm sure you got the NIV on your screen. So I'm going to read it from my Bible. I've also got the NIV sitting right here in front of me. Because it's important for us to get this. Let's, let's uh, do this like this. It says, okay, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect strangers in the world scattered throughout Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, two things I want to say there. Just look at the contradiction. They are in exile, they're away from, you know, from their own motherland, if you like, but yet they are a chosen people because exiles generally get treated differently from those who are indigenous people of the land, most times, right? But here it says, even though you are in exile on this side, you know, in your reality, you're in exile, in your natural state, you're in exile, but you have actually been chosen as what? As a king, and you're actually a priest. Wow, that's awesome. You know, just think about your situation. Even though you may be poor right now, you may be experiencing really hardship financially, but actually you're a billionaire. Wow. You may not have friends around you right now, but actually you are a very good social person. So you may not have achieved or be experiencing who God has called you. By the way, that's not less lesson one of things. But second thing I wanted to say right there, did you notice the Trinity in that part of scripture? He is God the Father, 
Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That's one of the verses where the Trinity is. The second one is in John, John chapter 5 and also uh, 1 John chapter 5 and also in Romans as well as um, I think about seven places where you can find the doctrine of Trinity. Of course, Matthew 28 is another one. Uh, baptize them in the name of the Son and the Father and of the Holy Spirit. So then the second thing in that chapter is about why trouble comes in verse 7. Look at verse 7, right, with me. Are you there? Go to verse 7. It says, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may be proved genuine. Trouble comes to prove that what you, what you desire or what you want is for real. You know what? In Matthew chapter 13, it talks about when persecution comes because of the word. Have you ever noticed that when you plan to do something instinctively or within a few, within a short time, persecution comes to test whether what you really want to do is for real or you're just saying it. You know, you think to yourself, oh, I want to lose weight. And then you say, oh, tomorrow morning I'm going to go jogging or I'm going to stop myself from eating certain things. And suddenly the craving for that type of food that you know is going to add on weight feels more appealing than any other food. Trouble always arises. Problem arises because of what you want to do. Oh, wow, look at the time. <laughs> then, um, the, in this chapter, he's talking about the results you get before even, it, it says, getting the end result now. In verse 9, it says, you are receiving the goal of your faith, the goal, the end result. You're actually getting it now. So, the same things you can get from the Lord, even though the time for it is not due. If you press into the Lord, you can receive the goal right now. Then it tells us here in chapter 1, it said, do not conform yourself. Doesn't it say that in verse 15? Go to verse 15 of chapter 1. It says, uh, okay, as obedient children, verse 14 actually, it's there in verse 14. As obedient children are not conforming yourself to the former lust. Do not conform yourself. What other, what other book or chapter of a Bible tells us not to conform. Do you know what that is? What other book of the Bible tells us not to conform to the pattern or to a particular lifestyle? Very popular chapter uh, and, and a very popular book. Do you know it? Let me give you 10 seconds to answer that. Okay, I start counting down. One, two, three, four, five. Is anybody gonna give us an answer? What other book in the Bible tells us not to conform to a particular lifestyle or particular pattern? You know, this is how you correlate scripture, okay? Like this is how you get to know scripture. Okay, that book is Romans chapter, go on, Romans chapter, yeah, Romans chapter 12, praise God. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay. Chapter 2 talks about, we're back to 1 Peter, okay? 1 Peter 2 talks about the, the fact that those people he was writing to were strangers, aliens. We know that from verse 11. So I'm going to go through very quickly. But in verse 3 of chapter 2, it tells us how we can grow up. How do you grow up in your salvation? Uh -huh. You can grow up by desiring the sincere milk of the word of God. If you want to grow, you're going to take in more of the word of God. There's no growth spiritually without spending time reading the word of God yourself. There's a very common trait amongst Christians today, which is they're taking in the word but they're taking in the word second hand. They're not taking in the word first hand. Christians will boast about how many hours they spent listening to Crepler Dollar or they listen to uh, uh, yeah, Mike, Mike Murdoch or they listen to 
a new man of God, or as good as that is, and I do listen to other men of God, right? So, hey, I'm not saying don't. However, if you are not spending time reading the word yourself, your growth will be not only sporadic, but it will be, you know, it just won't be uh, concrete. It won't be strong. You're not going to have strong growth if you yourself are not picking up the word of God and reading it. If all you do is listen to what people are saying, they're giving you an interpretation of what they've read or what God has said to them. God needs to be speaking to you as well. So please, in this age of technology where you can reach any man or woman of God's word online, do also make sure you spend time reading the Bible yourself. And then listen to everyone, as many people as you can listen to. In verse 19 of this chapter, it's talking about suffering for doing good. And then the healing scripture comes up in verse 24. One of the most popular healing scriptures. It tells us right there in that chapter that he himself took up our infirmities. Oh no, that's uh, Matthew. That's Matthew chapter 8. Right here, he tells us that Jesus, by his stripes, we were healed. Notice what he said. By his stripes, we were healed. This really correlates to uh, a conversation we're having on Friday, which is about, was it Friday? Uh, yeah, it was Friday. Um, we, no, it was two weeks ago when we listened to the book of James. Yeah, last week, book of James. What we're talking about in chapter 5 of the book of James, it says, is anyone happy? Let him praise. Is anyone in trouble? Let him pray. Then if is anyone is sick, let him call the elders of the church. They will anoint the sick person with oil and, and, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. The Lord will raise him up. Now, I, wanna, I want you to understand something. In that scripture of the book of James, it says the elders will anoint the sick person with oil. They'll anoint the sick person with oil. Now, hang on. What's the significance of that? Under the old covenant, the priest will check that somebody was healed first. And because the person is no longer sick, they anoint the person with oil. That's what's that's what happened under the old covenant, under the covenant with Moses. Or we understand as old covenant, right? Under the old covenant, the priest had to first inspect to see that the person's body is healed before they anoint them with oil. Under the new covenant, you are anointed with oil even whilst you are sick. Why is that? Can anybody answer that question? Why is that? Why does the book of James tell us that the elders should anoint the sick person? In fact, I think it's in um, Mark chapter 6 where Jesus told his disciples to go out and anoint the sick people with oil. Why? <laughs> Why here in particular in the book of James under the new covenant why are we told that the elders should anoint the sick person with oil when under the old covenant, you have to first of all inspect the person, make sure they're healed before you anoint them with oil. Why is that? Why? Does, it's a question. Am I getting some answers? <laughs> why, why are we told under the new covenant that we must anoint the sick person with oil. Does anybody know? Can I give you 10 seconds? Because our time is really fast spent. I'm not even got, <laughs> I haven't even got to any chapter right here. Okay. The reason is, the reason why we are told to anoint the person who is sick with oil is because as far as God is concerned, that's why it tells us in this verse, in this uh, chapter 2, verse 24, that by his stripes, we were healed. We were healed. As far as God is concerned, you may be going through sickness, but as far as God is concerned, you have been healed when Jesus was 
flogged on the cross or whilst he was carrying the cross or you know whenever they, they they got hold of him by that time by him receiving those stripes on his back as far as god is concerned your healing has already been paid for therefore you no longer need to be inspected to check whether you're healed before you are anointed as though you are healed in reality wow that's amazing that's amazing just to consider that under the new covenant you are anointed even whilst you are sick because as far as god is concerned you are healed praise god oh awesome <laughs> so the anointing is to confirm your healing that's what it does the anointing with oil is to confirm that you are healed that's why when faith people tell us that you should say you are healed, they're not saying anything wrong, right? And even if you, some people, they don't like, they don't like faith people. They just say, oh, they just name it and claim it, blah, blah, blah. But I can tell you, I'll tell you something for real. Faith people get more healing. They experience more of the goodness of God in their lives than those who don't believe. So, right, there you have it. In the third chapter, chapter three, it talks about, you know, husbands, uh, wives, I mean, it says, wives, submit to your own husband. He used the words, your own husband. This is chapter three, right? Chapter three, we talked about Christ as Lord. It also says in verse one, it says, wives should submit to their own husband. And I, every time I read things like own husband, I'm thinking, why is he saying that? Well, <laughs> you know, the reality is when you think about it, children sometimes are quick to submit to an uncle or somebody else's parents rather than their own parents. And if you're not submitted to your own parents, no, 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 you, you, you are not fulfilling scripture. <laughs> In the same way, perhaps Peter knew it will, it will be easy for a woman to submit to another man than her own husband. That's why he says, hey, make sure you submit to your own husband. And then, you know, it's easier for people to submit to some pastor they meet online. <laughs> it's just the way it is. It's easier for them to say, oh, yeah, that pastor, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I'm in a relationship with a pastor and he's online, you know, and they will ignore their pastor, their own physical pastor, and start, you know, professing their allegiance to a pastor online. Whilst the pastor online doesn't see them. Because we're not talking about you're in the, you are in a discipleship relationship now. You're just claiming that that man of God is your pastor. So it says, hey, wives, submit to your own husband. Then it goes on to say, husbands, respect your wife. Respect a wife. Sometimes a wife will give advice to the husband, and because the woman is his wife, he'll ignore it. And I've, I've, I've seen that so many times. Just ignore it. Ah, what do you know, wife? You know, but really it says, respect your wife in verse 7. And then in uh, further on in verses 19 to 21, it talks about baptism, and it's a lesson that I'm going to cover, so I'm going to skip and go on to uh, the fourth chapter summary. Fourth chapter summary is about how to leave, uh, uh, how to leave sin behind. You know, you can do that. You can leave sin behind. In verses two to three of chapter four, uh, it tells us when you suffer through your suffering and sacrificing, you can leave behind sin. Okay. Then it goes on and talks to us about judgment for all. If judgment begins in the house of God. How much more those who don't know the Lord? And then in chapter, and then in verse ten of chapter four, it reminds us to serve, to use our gifts to serve others. One of the reasons why, <laughs> excuse me, one of the reasons why you have gifts is so that you can serve other people with it. You know, we've been talking about uh, the how to discover, how to develop, and how to deploy your abilities, your talents. It's all about using those talents, abilities to serve other people, okay? Now, then it says 
if you suffer for and it's according to God's will. Let's have a look at that. Chapter 4, verse 19, because I want to pull something up here um, because I know our time is far spent for real. In chapter 4, verse 19, going forward, it says here, verse 19, Therefore, let those who suffer, now notice this, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Uh, the NIV puts it slightly different, doesn't he? Uh, it says, so then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Now, here's the deal. Whenever we talk about according to God's will, people apply it to all manners of stuff. And one of the areas that is frustrating, but I say this all the time, that people apply it to is the area of sickness. When somebody is sick, they say, well, you know, if you are, if you are sick according to God's will, hang on a minute. No, 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 no. Under the new covenant, I don't have a scripture that says you are sick according to God's will. And people are quick to quote uh, the book of Timothy, where Paul tells Timothy to drink a little wine because of his frequent st stomach illness. They're quick to, to, to quote that. But it's not saying that sickness was according to God's will. Otherwise, why is it telling Timothy to drink wine because of his stomach, frequent stomach illness? Well, supposing he gets healed whilst he's drinking the wine. And those who say, oh, you know, they, they are sick according to God's will, but then they're going to take some tablets. But they're sick according to God's will, they're going to take tablets. <laughs> right? And no, nobody ever says, oh, when, when I die, don't resurrect. I know some people say that, but I'm just saying generally speaking, the same people would not say, when I die, don't get the doctors to try and resurrect me or don't get the doctors to try and heal me. No, no. They're still going to the doctors. And you kind of think, hang on, how can you say your sickness is according to God's will and then you're going to the doctors to try and get cured, which means you're working against God's will, right? I say, well, no, 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 that's not what I, that's, that's not it. But what is it? It's either according to God's will or it isn't. But I can tell you for sure, it's not according to God's will. God, like I said in verse 24 of chapter 2, paid the price on the cross for your healing. And God wants you well. That's just the reality. God wants you well. Doctors, you know, it never amazes me how, whether you're watching a movie or you hear about this for real, when somebody dies in hospital, the first thing they do is to go there and spend a few minutes kind of trying to resurrect the guy with, the, you know, uh, you know, they're really trying to get this person back to life. <laughs> they're, they're working to get this person back before they give up. How much more should Christians do the same thing? Praise God. All right. In chapter 5, I'm going to come to this as a lesson, the threefold shepherding. I'm going to unveil that to us. But today, it's about the glory of God in verse 6. It's about you humbling yourself in, the, in that same verse. And then it gives us a scripture. He says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Cast your anxiety on God because he cares for you. What does that remind you of? What scripture does that remind you of? About anxiety. Cast all your cares onto Jesus because he cares for you. What does that remind you of? Uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. That's right. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, Present your request to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 4. Yeah, you got it right. And God says in verse 11 of chapter 5, he will lift you up. So, finally, in chapter 5, 
verse 13. Let's go there, take a quick look. You probably heard this many times, but this is where the scholars get it. They say, in, chap in verse 13 of chapter 5, it says this, She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Or another version says, so does my, my son, Mark. Well, Bible scholars tell us that John Mark, who also traveled with Paul and Barnabas, was actually the same John Mark that wrote the book of Mark, the 16 chapters of the book of Mark, Matthew Mark. He wrote that book and is considered to be Peter's spiritual son. All right. I'm going to stop there. I yeah, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop there. When we come back next week, and I what I'm going to do for next week, though, I'm going to read Second Peter and the book of Jude. Second Peter and the book of Jude. So when we come back next week, we're going to attempt to give the lessons as well as add some second Peter lessons and the book of Jude. We're going to try and squeeze. So next week's Bible uh, class is going to be slightly longer than this week. Probably going to do that for about an hour. Normally we'll do it for um, for 40 minutes or thereabouts. But we're going to extend it next week because we want to really get deep in Second Peter and also the book of Jude because there's a correlation you will discover as you read it this week. So spend your week still reading Second Peter and the book of Jude. So until then, I will see you soon. Do remember to subscribe to our channels, like the Facebook page. We need more of you to subscribe if you've not subscribed to our youtube page please do so if you've not liked our facebook page please also do so i can tell you that this is your own season to prosper yes 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 it is indeed your season to prosper god bless you and i will see you again on sunday when we go back and revisit our series on discover, develop, and deploy your talent, your abilities, so that you can have better job satisfaction, so you can reach more people, so that you can enter into the place that God has in mind for you and help God to extend his kingdom. God bless. Listen to this announcement. Thank God for everything and thank you for joining us today. Now here is your opportunity to give towards NICC and our ministry activities. As you can see, there's a budget shortfall for this year. However, your donations are making a difference. Here is our account number, which is 836-937-40, sort code 2089-15. And you can also give to us via PayPal at paypal.me forward slash NICC giving. You can also give towards our senior pastor, Pastor Bumi Tokon, via PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Pastor Bumi Tokon. Now, you will agree with me that we live in a broken world and all the attempts that we make to try and escape it, they generally fail. But when God created the world, he created it out of love, that we may experience his love. But sin came in and landed us in this broken world. However, God being so good has sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that we may experience God's purpose, God's plan and God's power, even in a broken world. Now, if you have made the decision to follow Jesus, please let us know so that we can help you in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Please remember that we have prayer for the nations from Monday to Saturday, from 12 noon to 12.15 GMT. And let me remind you that this is your season to prosper. Yes, your season to prosper.